going to begin in verse 1. We're going to make our way through verse 11. And uh, before we get into our text, um, we'll pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you give us the opportunity to come before you this morning to be able to study something as precious as your word. I pray that you would help us this morning to um, be able to keep our focus, give you the attention that you deserve. I pray that you would um, uh, just help us not to get uh, distracted by things that we have planned this past, uh, or this upcoming week or things that happened this last week. I pray that you would uh, help us even as the time has changed. Uh, we're going to be getting hungry earlier and there's going to be children that are getting a little bit more ornery. And uh, Father, I, I pray that you would help us this morning as we seek to understand what you have for us in this passage. I pray that you would guide our thoughts and help us to um, be humble as we receive these truths. I pray that you'd help me as I speak, help me to think clearly, help me to be able to communicate clearly. I pray that um, you would help everyone who is uh, taking this in, that it might be um, uh, profitable and uh, just easily applied. I pray that you give us wisdom as to how we ought to apply these truths. Father, I thank you so much for, um, for blessing us. Um, thank you for the grace that you've shown us this morning and for the grace that you have um, given to us in allowing us to study something so precious as your word. And guide us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've titled the message this morning, The Continuation. It was uh, some years ago now, we went through the book of Luke, and Acts is basically the continuation from the book of Luke. I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and then we're going to back up and I'm going to give you a little background, remind you who Luke is, remind you what the, the setting is and um, why he's compiling these, um, these documents uh, for us. I'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, into, taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his, after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after He had said these things, He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while He was going, um, Behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. That's our text this morning. <coughs> So who was this man, Luke? This um, author that uh, put together the um, books of Luke and Acts, um, you wouldn't realize it by looking at it, but he composed nearly a third of the New Testament. So by the time we get through the book of Acts, we would have covered a third after going through Luke uh, previously. Fifty-two chapters in these two books, and not once does he list his own name. 
This author was um, just a, a very influential force in the New Testament, and uh, we have much to be thankful for. This is um, really the complete picture. As he tells us, the first account he composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, and the implication is that now, as he continues through this book of Acts, he writes down more of what Jesus was going to do. And we see what Jesus did, uh, a number of different things happening through the Spirit of God, through the church being established, through missions taking place. And really what we have in verse 8 is an outline for the book as that um, information, the gospel, just uh, continues to spread. <clears throat> Um, why was he writing the book? It's a good question. I'll tell you. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we have more information that helps us understand the way that Luke put this information together, the attention that he gave to it, and why he was doing this. It says in verse 1, And as much as many have undertaken to compile an account of, these, of the things accomplished according, uh, among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So Theophilus, I'll tell you what we know about him. He is most excellent. That's what we know about Theophilus. Um, most excellent. What does that mean? Well, he uses that title in the book of Acts to speak of those who are um, officials, Roman officials. He could be uh, an official. He could have someone that is um, high-ranking in power, someone that uh, has more authority. But we don't really know. His name, Theophilus, it means a lover of God. Um, but then again, who knows what, if he was a lover of God. We see that Luke and um, Theophilus were uh, communicating, and Luke wanted to make sure that Theophilus understood exactly the truth of the things that he had been taught. So Theophilus had been exposed to um, Jesus, the things that Jesus had been doing. And Luke wanted to make sure that everything was put together just the right way. Uh, communicated very clearly and, um, and uh, consecutively. He makes his way through these, these books, um, most things being very chronological in order, but everything being very logical as he put everything together as it, um, as it made sense. And so this is the author of Acts. And one of the interesting things that takes place in, in the book of Acts, not having Luke mention himself in the book of Luke or in the book of Acts, we ask the question, well, how do we know who wrote these books? And ultimately what we know is that these were partners of Paul. And um, in Acts chapter 16, there's a, a tone change where he starts using the word we as he is ministering with Paul. And so we know the list of people that worked with Paul, and we know when this person was with Paul based off of what's going on in the book of Acts. And by process of elimination, Luke is our guy. I won't go through all of the elimination and so on, but uh, that's how we come to the conclusion that this Luke is the author. Who was Luke? Well, we know from Colossians chapter 4 that um, he was a beloved physician, and uh, he was with Paul doing many things uh, to help further the gospel. And uh, help us understand some of his perspective. As a, as a physician, can you imagine being a doctor and being in his, his place and then observing the miracles that were taking place? Of someone who, as a doctor, you know this should not happen uh, apart from it being a miracle. And that is exactly the, the position that Luke finds himself in um, often as he's exposed to these different things that happen um, miraculously. We also see that... Um, Luke was, he's really the, um, I think the only Gentile that we, uh, gave us something into the uh, New Testament. And um, he explains kind of the reason the, why he writes the way that he does using this uh, classical Greek form. And um, we also know that he was beloved by Paul. He had a special place in Paul's heart. Can you imagine? <coughs> <coughs> 
Um, can you imagine uh, being in all of Paul's different situations and having a doctor then come with you and all the elements that he dealt with and then you have a physician that's there helping you with, uh, with the gospel? <clears throat> so this is pretty incredible that uh, God would use this man to have such influence and uh, really it's through the inspiration of, uh, his, of the Spirit that we have this, this uh, reserve for us. Um, so he was beloved by Paul and um, he was also someone who um, was willing to sacrifice and give up his life basically for the cause of Christ and for Paul. What you see is uh, a physician saying, all right, I'm a doctor, and now I'm going to let go of that to go with this man to help proclaim and further the gospel, um, leaving his practice to help Paul. Um, it's pretty incredible. And Philemon, uh, Philemon 23 uh, Luke respond, he refers, Paul refers to Luke as a fellow worker, someone who would work with him and uh, would be there to support in that ministry. In 2 Timothy 4.11, he recognizes that only Luke is with me, and uh, everybody had left because of persecution, and Luke was faithful and courageous to the end to be there with Paul. And uh, so that's the kind of guy that's compiling these things, putting it together in an accurate way, and not just uh, compiling things, but he's going to the eyewitnesses to be sure that um, he has this, this straight, to be sure that he's recording the truth, investigating everything carefully, he says. And uh, so he goes to these eyewitnesses, puts these things together, and he thinks, maybe even in his own mind, that this is just for Theophilus, but God uses it to minister to everybody, even to today. So, his intention is to help Theophilus understand truth, and uh, he cared enough about this one man to write these two works. I think what you see is ultimately um, in Luke, this shepherd's heart that is displayed, possibly spending years of gathering this information to help solidify the truth in this in one individual. Um, and God uses this one man to impact thousands. And um, so that's where we find ourselves today in Luke, I mean in Acts chapter 1, the continuation. And why did, why did Luke split it up? Why is it written this way? Well, it's, uh, it's believed that most of the, um, well, in general, most of the scrolls, they would be about 35 feet in length was the max that they would write um, these, these things out on. And when you get to the end of the book of Luke, you end up right at about that 35-foot length. Um, and so it makes sense that after Luke writes that first account, then he then goes to the second account, and he continues on. And so that's why we have this uh, continuing, and he connects these two with that first verse. He says, in the first account, I composed Theophilus about all the things Jesus began to do and teach, and now he's going to move forward as uh, Jesus continues to work within, uh, within the church. <clears throat> I'm sorry. My, uh, my throat is not working. All right, so Acts chapter 1, verse 1. We have these, the author and the date. We see the reason for him writing. And we see some interesting themes in the book of Acts. Let me just remind you before we get into all of Acts that Acts is a, an incredibly transitional book. Um, there's unique and strange things that happen in the book of Acts. Um, just because we're transitioning from Jesus' ministry now into having a ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then you see the gifts that are displayed through the Holy Spirit. And uh, much of Acts is, um, is uh, narrative, and it is not meant to be normative. And so as we read it, we recognize there's biblical truth that is there. It is a narrative. It tells us what exactly happened. 
But that doesn't mean that you and I should expect the exact same thing to happen, but we do learn, and um, there's much, much to be gained from that narrative. And so as we'll go through the, um, through the text, you'll see different things. Like uh, in the beginning, verse, you know, the first chapter, they're, um, they're casting lots to see who the next person is going to be. And then uh, this is the last time you see them casting lots because after that event, the Holy Spirit comes. And so they're no longer casting lots. So there's these transitional things that happen um, within the book of Acts. And so we'll try and make sure that we pay attention to those things as we, as we come to them. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that we see is that the work was begun by Jesus. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Jesus began to do and teach. And these are the things that Luke was recording. Um, nothing, uh, you know, there's, there's much that could be said about the things that Jesus did and the things that he taught. But within this, this text, I think Luke is just mainly pointing out that he's bridging the gap between his gospel and this new, this new book. So the work began by Jesus, and we see that work um, continue. Hmm. We see that work continue by the apostles. Apostles get involved, and uh, verse 2 <clears throat> two through three. It says, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, for many by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So the work began by Jesus, work gets continued by the apostles, and Jesus gave these apostles the the orders by the Holy Spirit, and he presented himself alive to these apostles a number of times, just uh, again confirming with them the, um, that he was alive, that he was not dead. Can, and I want you to try and put yourself in their situation, in their shoes, trying to wrap your mind around your leader who has just, you've watched him be killed, and now he is alive, and now you're trying to reconcile all of these these thoughts of, okay, so this is what he said we were supposed to do. Now this is what we're doing. Uh, how, do we, um, how do we make sense of all of this? And Jesus really helps them connect all of the dots as he comes to, uh, to meet with them. In John chapter 20, and in verse 19, it says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, I think that's interesting, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Boom, there's Jesus. And he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his sides. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, then they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called uh, Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprints of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it in my, into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. <clears throat> have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, the, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John gives us the reason for his writing and he kind of sums up, you know, gets to the end of his book and he's kind of pointing out how the disciples have come around and how then um, 
Thomas, who was doubting, comes to believe. And I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around like how exciting and um, confused and just um, like if I were in the disciples' shoes, how you see how when they find out that this is the risen Christ, that they are rejoicing. How much would you want to then go and tell other people about this risen Christ after being there, after seeing him? And Jesus himself appears to them alive. And then he speaks, it says that he's teaching them, he's speaking to them things concerning the kingdom of God, really talking about the, the sphere that God rules over and, and his people and how they're supposed to live. He's teaching them about these things. And uh, the excitement that is building, the encouragement, the, the victory has been won, and how exciting it is. And in verse 4, he gathers them get together, and he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Can you imagine how hard it would have been for them not to leave? It's like, oh, okay. Gathers them together. Could be translated, they were eating together. It's giving them another proof of his resurrection. He says, look, I know this is exciting, but don't go anywhere. He's giving them some instruction right after they've been really called to action. And uh, you can feel some of the excitement. Jesus is alive. You need to tell others about Jesus. And Jesus says, all right, now wait a minute. Don't do this yet. He says not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. What he said, you heard, from, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so he says, look, don't go out there on your own strength. I got a plan. If you get out there, I can picture him looking at Peter and saying, Peter, you're going to mess this up. Don't get out there yet, right? He says, you need the Holy Spirit. And um, he says, stay in Jerusalem. I think there's some application for us as we look at this and we recognize the the way that God has orchestrated these things, these events as they take place. Sometimes when God is working out his plan, his plan, he wants us to wait. He wants us to stay where we are, and He wants us to wait. And this can be one of the most difficult commands, one of the most um, trying things for anybody, right, to have to wait. You feel the burden, you know the truth, you have that message, and uh, you want to impact eternity. You might have incredible motives. Sometimes God says, now it's time for you to stay. Wait, why would he ever tell his people to wait? I think ultimately what we see here is that God has a plan. He's got a big plan, and his plan it includes these people. And you see that throughout the book of Acts, how God exercises his plan using his people. And um, he, he puts them in the situation of waiting. And I think... Um, I need a tissue, but um, other than that, um, sometimes we have to wait. There we go. I'm falling apart up here. Sorry. All right. We ask the question, why wait? Why would God sometimes say to wait? And I think uh, here's five things that you should examine if you find yourself in the situation where you have to wait. And I know we all find ourselves in that situation at some point, right, of, well, I'm ready to go to that next step, that next level, whatever it is you're waiting for, uh, a promotion, you're waiting for some news from a doctor, you're waiting for the next thing in your life, the next thing in your family, whatever it is, you you find yourself in those situations. And um, while you're waiting, these are some things to examine, okay? This is just some practical advice, all right? Number one, while you're waiting... Sometimes God gives you that time of waiting so that you can rearrange and examine your own priorities to make sure that your priorities are what God says are your, should be your priorities, right? So if you're in that time of waiting, take some time to examine your priorities. Secondly, sometimes God puts us in that time of waiting 
to test us. He tests our faith. He says, how far are you willing to go? Are you, are you going to wait? How long are you willing to wait? He gives the disciples some information. He says, not many days from now. So they, they have that, you know, that looking forward to that moment. Sometimes he doesn't give us that. He says, now it's, now it's a test of your faith. How long are you going to wait? How long are you going to stay? Thirdly, when he puts us in that position of waiting, I think um, as we examine our priorities, we also can purify our own motives. Our own motives can be called into question and um, the reason for wanting to move forward may be the thing that we have to think about. Is it because I have some kind of selfish ambition? Is it because there's something that I want to gain out of this? Or is it because this is what He wants me to do? Fourth, while we wait, we increase our appreciation whenever He gives us that answer to move ahead. You ever been in a situation where you finally get the answer that you're looking for? And it's like, oh, the relief. How incredible it is to see God is not done. He's not finished. He hasn't forgotten about you, but He does have a plan for that problem, and He is going to see you through. Oh, the appreciation when that answer comes. Fifthly, when we're waiting, we are put in a position to be reminded that He is God and we are not. He is God and we are not. I think sometimes what makes waiting so hard is that we perceive or think that things should be happening in a certain time frame or in a certain way. And um, God says, no, that's, that's not what I have planned. Let me remind you, wait. That's what we see here in this first chapter of Acts with these disciples. They're all geared up, ready to go, and he says, all right, now you need to wait. I have a plan, and my plan includes the Holy Spirit, and it includes you. And so he gives them this, this reminder, the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the reason for the waiting how incredible that God would give His Spirit to these men, to us. He had made this promise. In John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, He says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. <clears throat> We have this comparison that is drawn for us as he uses John's ministry of baptizing people as the example. He said, John, he immersed people with water, but you will be immersed with the Holy Spirit. You will be immersed with the Holy Spirit. It's coming soon, not many days from now. That Holy Spirit, it came. We recognize it's something that we're able to also enjoy and how incredible that Luke is able to put down the beginnings of all of this. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you are God's, then you have been given his Spirit. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians six nineteen says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. As someone who has put their faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit now resides, dwells with you. <clears throat> Titus chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, reminds us that this Spirit has been poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have been given the Spirit and empowers us to do the work of ministry just as it will empower these men to do the work of ministry. And when they get to... Uh, Verse 6, now the question comes up. Uh, they're kind of wondering what the plan is. He's been kind of understanding some things and not understanding other things. It says in verse 6, <clears throat> it says in verse 6, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Restore has these tones of like uh, going back to what was once something great. I think they were thinking about the kingdom of David. I think they're talking about something that's happened in the past. They're saying, are you going to make it great again? 
And they're also recognizing that there's this, this ethnic connection. This is something that is to be Jewish, the, the kingdom <clears throat> to, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And in their minds, they're thinking geographically, where would this be established? This would be established in Jerusalem. That's important because as you get to verse 8, Jesus says, yeah, we're going to do something incredible in Jerusalem, but it's going to go further than that. He gives them the answer. It's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. This is not, it's none of your concern. What he doesn't say is interesting. He doesn't say, well, there's no kingdom. He doesn't say, no, it's not, it's, it's done. He says it's not for you to know what the Father has fixed. He has a plan. He has the authority to have that plan. And <clears throat> therefore, the disciples are put in a position of submission. I say, okay. Some more application here. When God says wait, it's usually, it is because he has a plan. His plan is always better than our plan, right? His plan will often make you <clears throat> want to ask questions, right? It's going to make you want to ask questions. What do you mean by this? Why are you doing it this way? Is now the time you're going to do something else? We're called to trust him. There are some things that you don't need to know. He puts the disciples in this position. Look, you don't need to know. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> you don't need to understand that. Sometimes God puts us in a position where you don't have all the answers. And that's really frustrating, I think, right? It can be, especially if you don't trust him, right? But as you trust him, you have the answers that you need, and that's enough, all right? And I think one of the questions, <clears throat> one of the real questions that comes up when we're wrestling with this idea of um, trusting him and, and we're thinking through um, giving him this um, this place of authority, and that's the real question. Does he have authority? Does he have authority? Does he have authority to have a plan, and that plan be over you and your life? He does, but we don't always act like that. That's the difficulty. That's where the, where the um, rubber meets the road, where things rub. When you assert your plans or when you move apart from God, then you stepped into the role of wanting that authority. The question that we ask ourselves and should ask ourselves when we find ourselves struggling with that is, do I really want to compete with God? Do I really want to compete with God? <clears throat> and so, verse 8, he continues. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. You're going to receive power. This is what they needed. He says, you will be my witnesses. This is what they were called to do. That word witness, the Greek word, um, mar martyrs, it's the word we get martyr from. So many of these witnesses are killed that it gets connected to one who dies for their faith. The word witness, it means one who has seen or experienced something or someone, or one who testifies of what they saw. These men saw something incredible as they spent time with Jesus, and now they are to go and spread it throughout the world. That the extent of this message is ever expanding. It's not just about Jerusalem. It's not just about Israel, but it goes much further. And in the book of Acts, you see it go much further than just dealing with God's people. <clears throat> and then in verse 9, I have kind of this, I find it a little uh, humorous. It says, And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he, was, uh, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. 
They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So these men, they're, they're watching, the men of Galilee. This is my last point. You see Jesus ascends. There are two witnesses that pop into the picture, and we're reminded that he will return. We're reminded that he's going to return. So Jesus goes up, these two witnesses um, <clears throat> in white clothing. Usually when we see witnesses in white clothing, they're angels. Probably two angels here talking to these men of Galilee. And they're watching them, and they're just um, gazing intently <laughs> into the sky. Gazing intently into the sky. I don't know what was going through their heads. Um, we can speculate. You know, maybe they're thinking, oh, he's going to come right back, and they're just watching, waiting for him to come right back. Maybe they're thinking, this is incredible. I can't believe he just floated out of my sight. Uh, maybe they're thinking um, uh, that uh, I don't know what it is that they're thinking, right? Could be, a, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there. There's a lot of speculation, right? But for whatever reason, God saw fit to bring two angels, two witnesses into the conversation to kind of snap them out of it. It's like, okay, there's, there's something they need to be reminded of here. He is coming back, so you shouldn't just stay there looking into the clouds. So why are you looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way. We'll come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And almost it seems like the implication is he's coming again, so don't just stand there watching. Be about the things that he's wanting you to do. I think it's important to recognize in our time of waiting, there are still things that we can do. Next week we'll get into that as we get into verse 12, but they're doing things. Verse 12 and following, they're doing things. And they're doing good things as Peter is reminding them of the things of the, that have been, they've been told about. He brings up some Old Testament uh, reminders from the book of Psalms. They go back to Scripture and they say, okay, so what does the Scripture tell us we're supposed to do? And then they start doing it. That becomes more application for us next week. Do the things that you know God wants you to do right now. And if he calls you to wait in a certain area, use that as an opportunity to grow. Okay. And thankfully, we're not in this situation the disciples are in, but now we have been given His Spirit that helps us as we make those decisions. And we'll see even more <clears throat> as the Spirit becomes a part and uh, really empowers these men uh, as they minister. That same Spirit empowers us to do ministry as well. We need His help. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you give us this reminder. Thank you for using Luke to put these things together and as he was in, inspired by your spirit. I thank you that we have these truths reserved for us so that we might better understand what our response ought to be. So we might better understand what the church is to look like. So we might better understand your, your spirit um, as it enables us to do ministry. Father, I thank you for the, the sermons, the messages that are given through the book of Acts that um, still have uh, continuing influence and and power. Father, I pray that you would help us as we, as we go from here, help us as we uh, evaluate the position that we're in, um, whether we're waiting in the line at the store or we're waiting on some big information from uh, um, something that may have life-altering effects. I pray that you would uh, help us as we uh, serve you, follow you, trust you, I pray that you would um, continue to grow us in those times of waiting. Help us to serve you in those times of waiting. I thank you that you always give us what we need. Help us not to fight with you 
when we don't have the things that we think we need. Help us to submit to your authority over us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.